In this video, I show you how to use a Python program using Pandas to download historical stock data from the International Exchange data site IEX Cloud. This is a revision of an older video with a similar name. This was made necessary because IEX changed their site and their site name from IEX Trading to IEX Cloud. They changed their API when they did that and they now require an account. This video shows you how to use Python 3 to download historical stock data for a full range of stocks and ETFs. Basically, high, low, open, close, and volume, adjusted and unadjusted, going back for many years. It's helpful if you know how to use a Pandas data frame, although if you don't, you can still copy exactly how I do it, and it should work, and then later you can go and brush up on a Pandas data frame. They're useful anyway. If you're using Python, you have to get around to using both Pandas and NumPy at some point, so maybe this is the time to start. Here's what you're going to have to do in summary before we cover it in detail. You're going to have to go to the URL shown here and create an account with a new username and password. Now that was not required under the old API, but it's required now. When you do that, you'll see that IEX Cloud has become a site that sells data and data services. However, they do offer a free account for downloading historical data for stocks and ETFs and much more, such as earnings and dividend data as they did in version 1 of their API. Once you have created that account, they will generate an SSH style private key or private token and public key or public token, much like the kind that you use on cryptocurrency sites if you're familiar with that. You don't need to understand how this technology works to use it, as we'll see here in the video. It's very simple to use. It is necessary, though, if you want to pull down this data. And then finally, after you've picked up your key and figured it out, then you have to use the Python program shown here or some modification of it to download your data, subject to very few restrictions. Now, going back through these steps, this is what the site is going to look like, more or less, when you go to iexcloud.io. And at some point, you probably want to explore the list of their products and some of their documents and their pricing and to see the distinction between what they charge for and what is free. But for the time being, you simply want to log in and establish your account. And you're going to get an email confirmation that will have this little box down here pop up somewhere. And you use that to confirm that you have created an account. Once you do that, of course, you can log in and you will get this menu shown here on the left side, this long black menu, and you'll have some information also on the main page, getting started and API docs, and you may want to spend some time perusing that. That's very useful to do. But before you go very far, you want to select API tokens from this page, and that will pop up your tokens as is shown here. And it won't show your private token. You can, of course, reveal it as it says, but it does show your public token. This is my public token, or was the public token I was using at the time I did this video. Of course, I'm not giving away any information about my account. It's called public for a reason. Also, though, as you can see here, you can change the token anytime you log in, and that is, in fact, good practice. And I've, of course, since done that, since making my video, so I have a different public token than the one shown here. The point, though, is that you'll need this public token to embed into your Python program so you can pull down the free data. And that's how it differs from the first API they've been using for about the last 18 months. IEX Cloud advises in their documentation to use a third-party app. And at the time of this publication, the only two they listed for Python were PyEX and IEX Finance. But we didn't use the third-party app. 
and I've used many of the features on the site and I haven't had to use it yet. I don't think you'll have to use it either so long as you're comfortable with using data frames because almost everything on the site is arranged as we'll see as JSON files and you can pull those down using data frames without anybody else's app. After you're comfortable with your public and private key, then go down here and let's take a look at some of the API docs. You need to spend some time going through this, but let's just go through the essentials right now. When you select that, this really long menu pops up over here, so there's plenty for you to read about, but you don't need all of this information. You only need some of it. You'll note right here, for example, that they seem to be providing a lot of dividend and earnings information, and I have downloaded quite a bit of that, and it is very valuable, and it's free. I'm not going to talk about it in this video, but I may make another video later where I do. What we're concerned about is, of course, this, downloading historical prices. So if you select that, you'll go in there, and somewhere you're going to find an example of the JSON files that they use for their data. And that's encouraging because if you know anything about Python, it is very easy to download and sort out and select information from JSON files. You can either do it directly in Python or you can use Pandas. And we're going to use Pandas because it allows a little more flexibility. These examples here on the right give us a sense of the range of the data we can download. We can use five years, two year, one year, and so forth. We'll come back to that when we take a look at the program itself to see how to use these options. The point being here, though, we're looking at JSON files. And so normally, a JSON file looks to Python like a list full of dictionaries. And that's going to be the case here. So if you're familiar enough with Python to know what that means, downloading this data is going to be easy to do. Now, let's take a bit of a diversion. I want you to download the program that I wrote, which is a Jupyter Notebook, and is found at this URL. This is the website for my Economics 136 class that I teach at Harvey Mudd College. So if you find that, then this is what the top of that page is going to look like and there's a lot of financial research data on the page. Go down that page and somewhere you'll find a section labeled Jupyter Notebooks. And although the section there may look a little different when you get to it than is shown here, somewhere near the top is an obvious reference to a Jupyter Notebook labeled IEX Data API Guide, shown here by the blue arrow and you click on that and an HTML version of that notebook should come up and that is the program that I am referring to for the rest of this video. The top of the program looks something like this. The very bottom line shown here, the DF temp equals and then the JSON read file is actually the only line we need to use to download this historical data. By the way, you don't need to be logged in to IEX Cloud when using your program. Once you have the key, you don't need to go back to the website for a while. Now, although in my program I actually insert the stock symbol and my token externally, as you can see on the bottom three lines of code down there, I have at the bottom of this page a single line of code that would work if you're trying to download two years of stock from Apple. And all of the code, no matter how you use it for your historical data example, consists of these four parts shown here, and I'll explain them systematically. This is a RESTful API, as they call it. RESTful APIs take advantage of the PHP features of HTML, and so long as the data is arranged like an XML file or a JSON file, it's very easy to simply download the data with a long URL that gives the program instructions about what you want to download and how you want to download it. So there's at the IEX Cloud API consists of four components. It has to start with the base URL, which is shown here in blue. 
That is followed by the word stable or beta, and we want to use stable. The instructions don't make it clear that that word has to be there, but if you take it out, this won't work. You put it back in, this does work. I didn't check the error message as to why it didn't work when you took it out. So maybe there's a way around this requirement, but for the time being, just put stable in there, and this is going to satisfy that. And then after that comes the uh, code for the historical data. And so that's going to consist of the word stock, even if it's an ETF. Uh, the symbol for the stock in question, the word chart, as though we're grabbing data to do a chart. And then finally, the duration indicator. And in this example I'm showing here, we're trying to download two years of data for Apple. In the program, we're trying to download one year of data for Tesla. So I can show you a couple of examples. Now let's divert ourselves for just a moment to remind ourselves that earlier we saw these examples of the duration. And so again, you can pull down five years or two year or one year, six months, three months, and so forth. If you pull down the designation by year, then the final piece of data will be the last open day before the day in which you attempt to do this. So if you're trying to do this on a Tuesday, then the most recent piece of data will be from yesterday's close. You can also put in dates. I haven't tried to do that yet since the two-year, one-year combination works just fine for me, but the instructions for using date ranges instead of these designators is in the documentation. And so then we add the fourth and final part of the URL, and that is going to be the PHP question mark followed by the word token equals, and then you substitute your public key for what here is my public key, and that public key is not inside of quotes, and it doesn't have parentheses. There is a quote at the end of this line, but that is matching the quote at the front of the HTTP. TPS line and has nothing to do with the token. So this, of course, is where your public token goes. When you change the token, then you need to change this entry here. This will work as long as the public key is the same public key. I've probably downloaded uh, 30 or 40 different files under the same public key before I finally changed it. Now, what does this get you? Well, when you take a look at the next two lines in the program, it has created a pandas data frame. And here we're looking at the top three rows and the bottom three rows of that data frame. These are debugging commands that you can later eliminate once you become comfortable with it. But first we got to see what it is we got from all of this. And you can see that. You can figure out what these things mean. We have not only a close, but a U close. And we have a low and a U low. And so you probably realize that the U close is the unadjusted close and the close is the adjusted close. So most of you will probably want to download the adjusted close. And so you'll just download the close, for example. But you can choose and download any selection of these columns that you want and discard the ones you don't want. And that's next. Now, the next thing we need to do is make this data frame look a lot better and organize the data the way we want to use it. So the first thing we want to do is set up the date as an index. And in a pandas data frame, we use the set index command to do that. And then we select the columns that we want to use from the original data frame and we arrange them in the order that we want them to appear, and we reject the others by simply not listing them. So for all of the columns we saw on the previous page, here we say, I just want to look at open, high, low, close, and volume in that order. And given that we have indexed this for the date, then the resulting data frame, which we are now calling stock underscore hist, looks a lot better than the original one did and is much easier to read and is more useful. So here we look for the head and we look for the tail and this is one year's worth of data. 
And by the way, it's for Tesla, and we can see that Tesla's had a very bad year. This opened a year ago at on uh, May 29th, 2018 at 278.51, and on May 24th, 2019, it's closing at 190.63. And so it's had, as I say, a tough year. Also, we might as well check and make sure that we have a length in our data frame that is what we would expect for a year's worth of data. And we have here 250 observations. And so there's about on average 251 or 252 market days in any given year. If you happen to do this on a Monday, I, have, I did this actually on the day after Memorial Day. So I got a length uh, one less than I would normally get at 250. But this confirms to us that we have the right size data set for one year's worth of historical data. And so that's it. You, could, you now have your data frame. You can use it for whatever you want. You can, in my case, what I'm likely to do is convert it to natural logs, take the difference of natural logs to get the daily continuous growth rate, and I can use that to build options pricing models, for example. It's also, of course, very easy to map with uh, matplotlib. You can use it for whatever you want. So uh, good luck with this. I hope this works for you.